Hello, welcome everybody to another very special Geneva Impact Talk. Tonight, we will be talking about our Geneva Impact initiative that we have started about half a year ago, supported by the Micro Pioneer Fund. An initiative that fulfilled the promise of Geneva Macrolabs to be more than a think tank, but to be a do tank. With our large and growing community around the world, we try to support sustainable development by leveraging the intellectual potential of our network and bringing leading minds together. Today, we will hear three project proposals about recycling, local farming, and tokenization of ocean assets. Before we start, please let me refer to some housekeeping rules as usual. We are recording this online talk and we will make it available on YouTube. We record it so that you, those who cannot make it today will still be able to watch it. And of course, you can also watch it again as well as post comments there. To access the recording, search for Geneva Macrolabs in YouTube. We will also post a YouTube URL in the chat. If you do not want to appear in the recording, please turn off your camera. We would also like to ask you to mute yourself while you're not speaking to avoid, avoid background noises. We will have a short Q&A session after each presentation. You can already start posting questions in the chat during the talks. Today's talk will be moderated by Renate Günther, Vice President of Geneva Macrolabs, and myself, Jörn Erbgut, Head of Technology Insights. First, Renate and Robert Zapfel, who is entrepreneur in residence at Geneva Macrolabs, will tell us more about the Geneva impact process. Renate, please. Thank you. Thank you, Jörn. So, um, Robert, what exactly is the Geneva impact process and how did it, does it work? Yeah, thank you, Renate. Um, the Geneva Impact um, creates new projects actually to address the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals and also to increase the number and the quality of impact initiatives in general. So we derive requirements for new products and services from direct market observations. And we discover topics in our society that need immediate attendance so similar to a venture builder, concepts are being developed as a first step. But now then, instead of building new startups, uh, we scout the market for the best teams to implement these concepts. That sounds very interesting. Why did you come up with this process? Well, you know, we believe that the current early stage startup investment procedures, they have too many risk mitigating hurdles built in. So as a result, um, there's too few new impact projects. And usually startups present their ideas and concepts, but often they cannot provide a proven track record for their own executive skills. And also quite frequently, their ideas don't match the actual market needs. We can improve the quality and the quantity of new impact projects. As I said, by deriving our concepts from market observations and by introducing two separate steps. First, the development of concepts. And second, the identification of teams with optimal execution skills. So each step can be supported by different groups of experts from our community. And so we can make, make it to perfection independently. Um, very reasonable. And uh, last question, why did you choose Geneva as your place of operation? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, because inequality in our society, for instance, or environmental damage uh, or climate warming, all of these things are obviously global problems. But if you look at Geneva, we have many international organizations. And also Geneva is a place, it's well recognized as a cradle for many global initiatives, be it the climate action, the human rights or other sustainable development goals, okay? Thank you, Thanks, Renate. Yes. Yeah. Thank yeah, you, yeah, Renate thank you. and uh, Robert. Today, we will present you the result of our first round of focus groups. At Geneva Impacts, it is not us designing project proposals, 
but it is the collective intelligence of diverse experts. And I have to say that we are very proud of these results that have been supported by a group of facilitators. Um, and let me start with the first focus group that has done the project Recycling Done Right. We all want to reduce waste and to increase recycling. Adrian Sameli and Charlotte Harder will talk about their project proposal. Adrian, everybody agrees packaging, especially plastics, is a global problem. Why has it not been solved yet? Thank you, Jörn. That's a very good question. So why are we still using so much plastics in our packaging products today? Well, first and foremost, because it's really cheap and very practical. We just have to acknowledge how convenient plastics are. Uh, these materials are not only lightweight, but also very robust and durable. They keep our products fresh and safe, especially our food and beverages. And now during the global pandemic, this is even more important. And plastic is so cheap, we produce three to 400 metric tons every single year. But it's not as simple. Packaging has a quite complex supply chain. There are many different stakeholders involved. And from the, from the raw material, it grows through many process steps before it reaches uh, consumers like you and me. And after we use it one single time, we just throw it away. We just don't care anymore. And because we only consider packaging as a cost, we do not see it as a valuable asset. It's no wonder that uh, recycling is still not cost, cost efficient today. Now the consumer markets are highly fragmented and different materials are all mixed together when we throw them away. And they are so hard to collect in one place and then break, the, break it apart into components. And without a steady stream of high quality waste materials, proper recycling is still more costly than creating new ones. Exact numbers are difficult to get, but we found that less than 10% of all consumer packaging, market, packaging uh, materials are really recycled. And now Charlotte uh, can explain to you what, what our group is trying to do differently. Yeah, so um, we were obviously a group of uh, several people and we quickly came to the point where we said, we definitely want to amplify what is out there rather than completely reinvent the wheel. I'm sure all of you are very familiar with different recycling initiatives um, and lots of them are brilliant. So how can we harness them and make more of them? We honed in on a few objectives, um, three of which I would mention. We wanted a really inclusive solution. So this means moving away from these silos, um, very localized approaches and looking at more collaboration and scalable global initiatives. Um, we feel that there needs to be a collective responsibility for everyone along the supply, production and consumption chain to, um, to hold that responsibility for packaging being reused and recycled. So we want to empower all of these parties. And how do we do that? We do that by more transparency um, through the use of all of the technology, the wonderful technology that we have today. And that's all about focusing on getting better information about packaging out there to get people being able to make more informed decisions. And the information itself is not enough. So the third um, objective is really to incentivize the good behavior, let's say. Um, this can be done through the feel good factor, gamification, uh, as well as, of course, monetary um, returns. I understand. Um, and I understand where you want to go to, but uh, what exactly do you want to build and where do you want to start, Charlotte? Yeah, brilliant question. Where to start? Because, of course, it's it's huge, it's so vast and complex. We as a group had a lot of uh, knowledge and expertise around the technological side of things and we feel 
that's where the um, solution lies really in scalable, inclusive and full impact uh, situation or solutions. So we're looking at an open database, a decentralized ecosystem, if you like, um, that informs people where, where materials can be recycled and specifically what they are made of. This requires suppliers and producers um, declaring information and consumers being able to know where to recycle. And then next to this uh, digital online solution, really the packaging labels themselves. So um, they need to be readable by the eye and we want to make that attractive and easier to understand and scannable so we link into that system and have all of that wealth of information. And I've got a little something to give you an example. What we want to do is what you see basically here in terms of nutritional values on food, we want to create something like that for packaging. But obviously this is a concept, coming up with the finance, financial model is uh, another thing which maybe Adrian can mention quickly. Yes, thank you, Charlotte. Um, so, so we see the biggest potential in eco-friendly retail chains and consumer brands. And we want to establish the, the concept of recycling loyalty programs. Because most consumers uh, already visit the same store over and over again. And they could easily return their package at exactly the same place where they bought it. And these stores are literally doing everything to keep their customer retention high. So why would they not also reward their consumers for their for waste collection? As a first step, uh, we would like to offer a retail consumer mobile app. So when I, as a consumer, uh, I want to know more information about the product, I could simply scan it and the app would tell me all the recyclability features of that product packaging. And it will also show me uh, the different materials it's made of and where I can return them uh, close to my vicinity. In addition to that, brands could also showcase their sustainable packaging. So uh, me as a consumer, I could finally control my ecological fit footprint by uh, responsible consum consumption. And the best of all, I'm not doing it alone. I can see that my favorite brands are investing in my loyalty and also our future. But we also must improve the infrastructure. Most retailers already today offer in-store collection points. They allow me to return some packaging, but not all of it. And the usability is also not so ideal. So with our technology, we will improve these collection machines so that every item can be scanned and processed automatically. And as a consumer, I would then collect reward points. And in the back end, we could finally have accurate recycling data. We would know exactly what packaging was returned in what location. And with that, we could even forecast the supply of recyclable materials. And with this information, we could make the whole process of recycling much more efficient and sustainable. Our approach is closing the loop from production to consumption and back. We will create a circular economy for sustainable packaging. And we, were, we will include all stakeholders so that they can be all equally responsible together and have an impact on the global market. Wow, that sounds like a plan. Um, hope this can be realized. Um, I see we already have a lot of questions. Uh, and um, Renate, please lead us through the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Thank you also to Adrian and Charlotte. Uh, great presentation. Jerome, would you please unmute and ask your question? You have an interesting one. Sure. So thanks a lot, Adrian, Charlotte, for your presentation. Um, I think it's a very important and topical subject, especially given the amount of plastic being produced and the fact that it ends up in our environment with corona, et cetera, as well, so healthcare waste. Um, what about the actual subject of or going to the root cause, reducing the use of plastic in packaging? Do you not see that as part of the issue? Absolutely. Thank you very much, Sharon, for that important question. I mean, going to the root cause and, and reducing um, 
is definitely important, but we cannot deny the fact that packaging is is so widespread and so practical. So on a, on a daily basis, there is so much applications for it. And there are also other, other um, packaging types that we could um, replace uh, uh, plastics for. But the reality is we still have so much plastics and, and, and it's, it's everywhere. And we, we need a, a clean way to, to recycle it and to, to put it back into the circulation so that uh, um, we can build on, on that, uh, like these quality features that we are having today. I think I would just add from my side as well, I, I think it's two things that we're dealing with. I absolutely agree with you that we need to reduce the amount of plastic. Um, there is a need, obviously, as we've discussed, but I think with this system, the openness of the system that we're looking at, even that could be built in, right? You could look at how many grams of packaging are in that particular product. So there's a lot of scope with our technological database approach to add in these elements uh, piece by piece as we, as we can address them. I think it's a step-by-step -step, uh, approach. We're probably not gonna kill all the birds with one stone directly, <laughs> but good question, yeah. Thank you, Charlotte and Adrian. So, Dr. Ashutosh, would you like to unmute yourself and ask a question? Thank you. Uh, my question is regarding how much uh, we have done the feasibility study on the comparative models available to us. Like I said about the stained paper is one, and uh, I mean, we need to focus on things uh, which are workable and uh, are doing well in other countries, other parts of the world. Thank you for the question. So if I understand you correctly, we need a solution that is working globally and not just in, in a, a certain yeah. area of yeah. the world. Uh, absolutely. So that's why we choose um, with our project, we want to do, uh, we want to go to the source, not of the material itself, but um, of the information. And uh, we suggest to use technology and, and uh, build a platform uh, where we can track all all the recyclability features uh, in the future, not only pack, um, plastics, but also different materials. But if we have the information available, uh, what is a product made of and how you can um, process it and recycle it. And then if we in improve the labels on the packaging itself, then we can uh, create something that is available, uh, the information that is available throughout the world. And to me, uh, it does, it's definitely the first step that we create more transparency in what is in it and what, how can you process it. And we have to make it accessible for the rest of the world. So if, if you see a product and then you have the information what to do with it, you can also do that uh, on the other side of the world, especially if we work together with uh, global corporations like um, fast moving uh, consumer goods um, distributors. Uh, the same information can be available everywhere, and then you can process it uh, locally, and that could even support uh, local waste pickers or local recycling facilities. That would be a, a way to jumpstart the whole global uh, movement. Thanks. Thanks, thanks so much. Charlotte, do you still want to add something? No, I think that's... Uh well answered and and i know that the other groups have really interesting things as well so i don't want us to steal much of their time <laughs> thank you so um yeah back to you jan for the next presentation thank you renate thank you for your questions thank you adrian and charlotte for um, your brilliant answers the second focus group we will listen to plans to boost local farming eating healthy and reducing transportation will benefit all of us and the environment. Please let me welcome Frederick Claus and Alexandra Pelka to talk about their project proposal. Alexandra, how is the local farming project addressing the SDGs and what are the key elements of its sustainability impact? Very good question. So what we are trying to do is we create a community around a very local experience and unique interaction of a supply chain that is very short. So we try to tackle almost every single one of the SDGs we are looking at, creating a platform for local farmers to bring their products to the end consumer, 
but growing it really at source. So no long transportation, no un unused, uh, uh, not, <laughs> there is no, as, um, so sorry, there is the possibility to source locally. So if you take the food from the environment you have already and seasonal, you will reduce not only the waste as it was already mentioned before, but you also have the possibility to lower the CO2 to reduce the, the waste that is created whilst also enhancing the quality of the products because they are picked when they are ripe. Instead of, let me make the example of a strawberry. If you can have on-demand strawberries 365 days of the year, you won't have a lot of taste in them because you transport them, or pick, you pick them when they're green, you transport them for thousands of kilometers and put chemicals on them to make them ripe and look nice when they arrive, rather than picking them in a stage where you can already eat them. So our products would have a much shorter history to tell. It's a much shorter story. They are actually planted where you're currently living. So right at the next farmer, they sit there waiting in the sun, getting ripe and then pick when they're ready and when they're sweet. And I'm pretty sure you know the difference at the first bite. So what we are trying to do is bring together and shorten the supply chain while looking at a local community that interacts with each other and giving the farmers also the possibility to talk to the consumer and have the information they need in order to pick when it's uh, requested rather than producing uh, vegetables or fruits or other uh, products in, in waste uh, that rather ends up in landfill than is sold. So for example, if there is a farmer's market, it's very much depending on the weather. It's very much depending on how many people are coming. But if you have a platform where the consumer can communicate to the farmer how much is needed and when, they can make a calculation that is much easier for them uh, to really understand the needs of their consumers. So for us, it's a, sorry, for us, it's a very good methodology to bring together the whole stakeholders and to also give, for example, schools the offer to, to introduce local farming as something very, very sustainable not only environmentally, but also socially. Thank you, Alexandra. I'm getting hungry for some very delicious, healthy fruits. Um, Frederick, how do you see the implementation steps and how do you see the project practically in real life? COVID, I think, I mean, the way we've experienced COVID has exposed, I mean, the uh, dependencies to the global market and sometimes our, our supply chains were weak and uh, and alexandra i mean just mentioned that these supply chains i mean uh, are not necessarily the one that we want to promote in the future and the the good side of covid it has also i mean put us in the situation where we are today working differently uh, i mean working from home for good numbers of uh, companies is likely to become the new normal um, and we have started also to explore a, a different type of consumption or or, or uh, shorter um, supply chains with producers. Um, when we started the, the project, we discovered um, to a point that was not anticipated at the beginning, that today farmers are mainly earning from subsidies, not revenues. And it's up to 90% of their income that is generated by, uh, revenues, by their subsidies. So establishing a direct link between the producers and not only the farmers, it can be the beekeepers and, uh, and other food, and the project is focusing on food, um, is a way to, for the producers to set the prices. Um, in our uh, experience, we discovered also, I mean, to uh, our great surprise that the premium charged by the carp or Lidl are not the 40 or 60% that we thought. Uh, Lidl margin is under 20%, and typically carp and Migro are in the range of 240%. When sometime for the price of a milk, few cents that we would pay in addition to what we are ready to pay would give the farmers enough revenues to actually leave from their uh, production. 
we looked initially at the Swiss market because the Swiss market is is in terms of dimension is easier. We have not metropolitan centers, but big cities, not very far away from rural and farming land. So it's easy to, uh, to anticipate the, the supply chain. Um, we've looked at the French speaking part to um, launch our pilot. Looking from the Châtel, Jura, Vallée, Vaux, uh, Geneva, um, the local market that we have uh, envisaged is a 40 uh, kilometers diameters. And if we look at the area that I, um, I mean mentioned, we are talking about 11 sub-markets. Within these 11 uh, sub-markets, initially we looked at bio and discussing with experts. They explained us that in Switzerland, unlike in other European countries, uh, the IP, that is the local standard farming uh, standards, are actually quite good. Um, so um, the project would start in Switzerland with not only bio, but uh, uh, the, the local farming as it exists. And just to prove that, I mean, the, the type of project that we are focused, I mean, anticipating is very much right. There is gonna be two rotations at the end of, uh, of June in Switzerland on, on the bio farming and, uh, and reduction of pesticides in the, in the, in the farming uh, uh, production. So this is for the parameters. The project is basically comprised of uh, digital platforms. Uh, digital platforms already exist in Switzerland. We've been able to map about 45, 50 of these platforms just in the area that I mentioned. And these platforms are extremely segmented. They don't usually offer a full scope of information for the consumers. And as, as mentioned by the other group, the traceability and the building confidence of consumers comes with a certain type of information that the consumers want uh, uh, to be able to select the product that they want. So the digital platform will be um, between local producers and consumers within this 40 kilometers uh, uh, diameters uh, uh, range. Uh, many of the platforms that exist have also develop their own delivery platforms. They do the supply chain. When in our case, we think that supply chain exists already by many means. It exists by local delivery company. It exists in, the, in, in certain uh, city centers by uh, the by cargo social projects. And rather than reinventing that, the project is looking at building uh, what already exists, using what already exists, and also looking at something that is emerging in Switzerland, considering each of us, each of the consumers, potentially as a vector, as a channel to do the delivery. Meaning that I'm not only consuming, I'm, I'm, I can on certain occasions go and collect my order from the, from the producer, but instead of coming back only with my order, I can come back with my order and the orders of colleagues or orders of of neighbors um, as a different way of looking at supply chains. We are also looking at supply chains as a, as a web of interactions between producers and consumers, all of them being engaged in social activities, schools, public community, and these centers could be places for collecting these, uh, these, uh, these goods. Uh, in our model, the producers are setting up the prices and they are free to do that with the margin that I mentioned that are currently imposed by the, by the, by the market chains or I mean, just a, a, some of the, of the big companies that exist in the Swiss market, but elsewhere. Um, it has proved uh, as a success in France. I mean, there is a brand that has established Qui uh, uh, le Patron and Qui le Patron has moved from a few hundred thousands of, uh, of uh, of uh, uh, revenues per year to a couple of million euros. And Kissel Patron is giving the producers the right to, or the power, not the right, mm -hmm. the power to establish the, the cost. Uh, and for the, producer, for the consumers to decide where they want to, to direct their orders and where they want to, uh, to, um, to, uh, to put the, uh, their money. Typically yeah. our systems, the order is placed uh, before 9.30 for, same day delivery. So it's not the 
the flexibility of, of buying your lunch in a, as we see today in the restaurants and you have a delivery uh, uh, ensured within the 40 minutes. In our model, this doesn't exist. So it's mm. a same, same day delivery. Uh, the project applies a fee on the transaction as well as a fee on the, on the delivery. And it, uh, it builds on the relationships with, with the community. Thank you, Frederick. I think uh, I'm, I'm just taking over because uh, we have already questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jerome, would you like to speak out? You have a question, please unmute. Yes, thanks a lot both for your presentation. I have a question around the implementation. If I understood the concept correctly, you are asking farmers to update the app with the produce that they have seasonally, as well as to package those products and then to liaise with third parties, either the individual picking up or with delivery uh, delivery firms. Have you spoken to farmers? Do they have the time for this and the capacity and training? We just have the farmers who actually, I mean, today the, the farmers are inputting the data on existing platforms. And usually they pay for these platforms. In our case, they don't pay for these platforms. We do the design of the platform for them and they just input the data. Once uh, they have entered uh, the data about what they offer, they don't. They are not requested to do more than that. Except that when they receive an order, they have to package it with packaging that we provide to reduce the packaging, as it has been mentioned in the previous. Uh, um, uh, I mean, working group. We are looking at at uh, recycling package in our case. The platforms picks the orders, and I mean. I mean, basically, it's a matching between the consumers and the, and the producers, and it's a matching with the supply chain. So once an order is placed, um, the platform is uh, trying to regroup the orders and is seeking a third party uh, uh, delivery company uh, to, uh, to pick these orders and to deliver these orders to, uh, to the final point of delivery. As I mentioned, in some of the cases, we would like to create a, a movement whereby consumers would like to pick up their orders to the farmers because they think it's a nice idea to also pick, I mean, to collect orders on behalf of other consumers in order to, uh, to reduce the carbon emission around the transportation. So we don't ask producers to get involved into the supply chain because as you correctly mentioned, it's not their job and it's the app that does the matching and, and tracks the orders from, from the producer sites to the final point of the delivery. This technology exists. Um, it exists in various forms and shapes. Um, uh, the one that I mentioned about making consumers uh, uh, channels for transportations has just been launched in, uh, in, uh, in Switzerland at the beginning of the year. There are many looking at delivering uh, letters and, 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 um, and, and dry products, uh, but it could be expanded to, uh, to fresh products with a, a little bit more of, of carefulness in the tracking. Thank you, Frederick. Did... Uh, we have another question from Dr. Ashutas. We have uh, some, uh, yeah. Some participants who are quite active today. Uh, 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 the, the project presentation is, uh, as it appears to me, that uh, you should have blockchain and uh, data analytics into the project because you need to have a very sound base on technology. This for the future, and uh, if you want to avoid the wastages, if you want to avoid, uh, if you want to target the customers uh, and uh, the the regions in a proper way, cultivation, you need to have blockchain. I think uh, if we can uh, uh, take a look at my suggestion, that should be a good thing. I don't have an answer to these questions. Um, we are not looking at actually at getting engaged in the production. We believe that local producers are the best equipped to, um, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to guide the production. Uh, that, 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 that analytics is critical in the sense that over time, with the seasonality, 
uh, and with the market basis uh, growing, we should have a better understanding of what is consumed over time. Um, but basically, I mean, the project is 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 uh, is is not looking at at collecting and storing, uh, but but collecting uh, what is available and and delivering that to the consumer. Uh, the blockchain is still an, a question mark. Uh, it could be appealing for to indeed, I mean, to uh, to inform, I mean, some some of the element of the project. But blockchains, as we all know today, comes with a, a lot of energy consumption, and and uh, and, and probably at the, its in infancy, the project, I mean, could operate with limited blockchain, and at its developed. Um, uh, um, blockchain, I mean, maybe could uh, could be considered, but the, the the energy consumption of the blockchain is is something that will need to be uh, taken into consideration. But on that front, if you are willing to uh, take that discussion offline and 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 give us some hints, I'm interested. Definitely, and of course, there is also the possibility to use an eco blockchain, for example, to track the CO2 and do CO2 offsetting, but that's something that will be probably possible in the future, but we are looking at something something else at the moment. Thanks, well, Alexandra. I think uh, there's, a, there's a cocoa uh, blockchain uh, pattern being used uh, in uh, Brazil by uh, retired uh, major of the U.S. Army, and if mm -hmm. you go into that product, I mean, it's it's a cocoa procurement uh, from uh, cocoa plants of Brazil, and the way they are doing, I mean, it's the, almost the same. If it's my suggestion, just go through it, and that research can help you. Thank you. Yeah, very interesting comments. Thank you. Back to you, Jan, for the next group. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Renate. Uh, interesting comments there uh, about blockchain, and we, uh, as you might remember, we have uh, an, uh, authored a blockchain um, paper uh, in the past, and um, we have focused here not on technology but on solutions. And so, um, blockchain is not always the best solution, but uh, also only in in some cases. Uh, energy consumption, uh, by the contrast, is not the main concern here because uh, we are not talking about public blockchains like Bitcoin or Ethereum. Um, but uh, there has to be a reason for it. And uh, if there's a reason, of course, it's, it's a technology uh, that can be chosen. Um, but I think the, the business concept is the, the, the main part here. Um, so thank you, Frederick, Alexandra and Renata about your uh, exciting discussion. Um, and last but not least, we would like to introduce you to the third focus group to tokenization of ocean assets, reducing carbon dioxide, and at the same time, saving ways is possible. Let me welcome Rias Jogiat and Denis Erkus. What does it mean, Rias, to tokenize ocean assets? What traction can you achieve with your business models proof of concept? Yeah, good evening, everyone. Thank you for that question, Jorn. Um, just to take a step back, our, our group was put together to explore the tokenization of ocean assets. Initially, that was whales. Um, the work originally stemmed from an IMF report that conservatively valued the current pool of whales at approximately one trillion US dollars based on the various activities that whales are involved with when it comes to reducing carbon emissions. Um, when we took a step back, we, as we were looking at ways to build our business model and proof of concept, um, we really want to understand what it meant to obviously tokenize or assign ownership to a public good or process um, in this case, um, to learning about the carbon credit markets in general. And maybe this is where I thought I'd provide a little bit of insight uh, to, to, to the audience. Um, 2020 was a, a banner year. The primary markets, the carbon credit markets, grew by 20% in 2020, reaching 229 billion euros, or five times the value of 2017. Um, Europe alone represents 90% of this market, and prices actually hit a record 33 euros per ton last by the end of last year. Um, over 8 billion emission allowances changed hands last year. The secondary market, or the voluntary market, is also growing. Um, we recently came across a report 
that uh, where IBM announced that they were going to buy carbon credits at a rate of twenty dollars per ton, um, and this market is also expected to grow by uh, grow to fifty billion by twenty thirty. Um, the carbon credit markets I find or we found are an interesting way for markets to invest in innovative projects that can offset emissions that you know humans generate. So in short, there is a market for carbon credits and one is and one that is growing. Uh, the models are suggesting that we won't be able to get to zero emissions world based on current and future trends. Um, and again, you know, the carbon markets offer an interesting incentive mechanism to offset our behavior. Now, where do we participate um, to get early traction? I think Denise will share more thoughts on our proof of concept, but what we are looking at is investing in different types of projects where attribution can be linked, certified, um, that generates carbon credits uh, that can be exchanged and reinvested back into the project. As oceans and whales in particular aren't very static, uh, the types of projects that stood out to us were growing and maintaining plankton farms, uh, a microbe that produces 20% of global, global oxygen, um, capturing carbon from the atmosphere and storing it deep in the oceans to monitoring and tracing whales to promote healthy stock. So there's quite a few options out there. Obviously the ocean is a big space. Um, the key is going to be validating the science and certification. Um, that's going to be key. Thank you, Rinas. Uh, Dennis, can you tell us a little bit about the key financial metrics for this idea? How does protecting the ocean and carbon sequestration and connect? Yeah, thank you, Arne. Um, from our research so far, we have mostly seen non-profit structures with partnerships and corporate tie-ins. We anticipate three stages for this project where the profit and non-profit connect and execute. So this is our starting point. Stage one is the research on the process for the project to become feasible. A sustainable impact investing structure. The objective is to create carbon credits linked to ocean assets in the voluntary market. We know that there is both primary and secondary market for the carbon credits where demand, high demand and supply for high quality emission credits will grow over time. This is the pathway to develop a sustainable circular financial model that invest in various carbon sequestration projects with a strong focus on ocean asset preservation and growth. So research is to create effective processes for certification, attribution for positive outcomes and their valuation. The initial funding is for creation of a, of a, of a project team with subject matter experts around our table such as scientists, ocean marine experts, engineers, technology and finance experts, and also governance. So we legal compliance are very important as well, regulatory on that project. So the costs for this stage will be related to the team, mainly talent and technology focused. Uh, next stage is, uh, is where we create a pilot with a specific focus on a region or market to test the concept. For example, we create a foundation investing in a few projects on a, uh, with the initial funding. Revenue stream is, will be uh, coming from a carbon credit trades in the voluntary markets. And we know that these markets uh, will continue growing over time. A part of those revenues can be reinvested in the foundation to create funding to invest in other projects. So we create here a sustainable circular system. The next stage three is when we create an impact investment fund where the large institutional investors as well as public and philanthropic capital can be invested, connected to the foundation as a circular uh, sustainable uh, model and with a certified carbon credit asset manager structure supporting the system. This structure has a huge potential to grow to a global investment opportunity where the fund can invest in one, certification platforms, branding platforms, matching investors with the ocean specific projects, two, investment opportunities at different stages that have carbon sequestration, impact measurements, KPIs, and all related to whale initiatives, plankton, uh, kelp growth, etc. There are 90 assets more or less in the ocean. 
So revenue streams then will be trades in carbon credit markets and the project's cash flows, as well as valuation at the exit stage. Ancillary revenues can also be branding on data on that project. So uh, since early 60s, we know that the environmental issues needed focus. As of today, we need to act and execute such projects. And we know that uh, us as a humanity, we have taken a lot from our mother earth for a long time. Now we believe that with that project, we can give back to our mother earth. Time to pay our karma credits, as we call, to save our children, grandchildren, our humanity. Each human being has at least 70% of water in the body. So biologically, we are connected to the ocean. Now it's time to, for humanity to reconnect to the nature and work with the planet to live together. So this is the objective of the project. We want this project to be global, not only Europe, not only uh, Switzerland, but can go a global project for a global issue for our ocean. Wow, what a great idea to uh, basically <laughs> uh, finance uh, the protection of the ocean and by carbon credits. Uh, I guess there are a lot of questions. Uh, Renate, please uh, tell us about the questions of our community. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jan, uh, Denise, Andreas. So I have a question from Christopher. Would you like to speak out? It's a comment or a question. Do you want to speak out, Frederick, and unmute yourself? Uh, uh, hi, everybody. Um, hi. Nice to meet all of you. Um, very, very exciting. We can definitely assist programs like that, as I just put into the chat, um, where we can assist uh, projects who are looking at scientifically verified carbon sequestration so we don't have to reinvent the wheel we can assist you there denise denise and i we've already about that, right yeah um exactly. and uh so we can do that for marine carbon sequestration which we have you know we're working with a very uh, uh, interesting partners there likewise for terrestrial carbon sequestration and everything is underlined by blockchain technology there was a comment about the energy intensive um, usage of blockchain. That's a general statement. There are solutions out there that are not energy intensive. We are employing those. I, I don't want to bore you guys with the details, but um, it's a win-win. There's a synergy. Let's get together. Let's keep the planet spinning, OK? That's the long and short. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. That's a very good command. Yeah, I have another question. Um, so what are the potential risks to your business, Rias or Denise? I guess I can start this one off. Uh, risks, um, I mean, there's many. You're, you're dealing with uh, a brand new carbon credit market that is you know, fairly new to human history. So there is risk when it comes to certification, but it seems to me that based on the conversations we had, we've had with subject matter experts, um, it, it, it's perfectly doable. I, I, I think another risk may be just the feasibility or viability of the different projects that we're looking at or evaluating. Uh, attribution quickly may be challenging. I mean, people want attribution now or yesterday. Um, when, when can we see a measurable change in the amount of carbon that we're offsetting? Can that be measured in, in time scales of months or days? Probably not. Uh, that's, that's where we, we have to think years out maybe. Um, so definitely we're looking for investors that are that have patience. Thank you, Denise. Do you also have a comment? Otherwise I would go to the next question. I mean, uh, we are talking here about the investment structure uh, attached to a foundation where, uh, you know, public, private and philanthropic money come together. And uh, obviously uh, it, it's a big goal. So uh, there are risks attached to it in terms of the investment, in terms of the market, as Ria said. And because there are, we want to create also revenue streams to make it fully sustainable and circular. Um, it, it, there is a lot of uh, concepts that need to be uh, verified 
We need to work with the experts. We need to use the technology a lot. So all these things come need to come all together. And possibly like Christopher suggested, you know, there are some work done out already. So uh, community and collaboration is the key to reduce that type of risk. Okay, and just uh, one last point regarding the investment capital. Can you um, evaluate, uh, can you elaborate on that a little bit more? How the investment capital will be used? I think there can be maybe some more details added. Um, maybe I take I'll start with that one. Um, so as you, as I mentioned, there are three steps here: um, research, which is a very crucial part of the project. And there, uh, the capital is going to go into the research and uh, creating the concept. Uh, purely project management, technology, experts, scientists, engineers will come together and, uh, uh, and we, will, uh, uh, the, we will create the proof of concept actually, for, ready for testing. And a second one can, uh, can um, creating a structure which is one of the you know uh, use of funds I can I should say use of funds will go creating a simple structure to test um, the the the, proof, the the concept uh, that's that's the idea and and uh, choosing a specific region or market um, and uh, see uh, you know how we, how we are going to create a return for the uh, investors and how we are going to satisfy the needs of the of the market as well. The third stage is where actually the capital needs to flow in because uh, that's the stage where the investment fund is going to be created, where uh, the foundation is going to stay there or foundation or another, you know, I'm, I'm calling foundation. But, um, and there uh, we, we, uh, we want this as from the beginning, this is the crucial part of the project is sustainable and circular. So we want even the foundation to be sustainable on its own and impact, uh, impact fund, impact investing fund, uh, you will use the capital that comes in for uh, generating the revenues in the trading, you know, carbon credit trading, uh, and also will do, will have a very strong ethics, due diligence, uh, corporate governance, asset management to manage uh, and select the uh, potential investments. And also to, to, it's going to work as a private equity fund uh, uh, as, as to, together. So uh, the capital is going to go there. Um, and um, yeah, it's going to work as a normal investment fund. <laughs> oh, Thank you. Me, because I'm very excited about the <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I have one last question for... Um... Adrian and Charlotte, um, can't we just burn used packaging? Well, that's what's happening at the moment. Um, and people are winning energy through doing that. But of course, that's um, it's, it's a very short minded approach. So as also came up in the questions, right? How do we reduce the amount of materials that are being, you know, uh, taken out in the form of oil? Um, I think, yeah, basically our project looks to solve the wider, deeper problem um, than simply just getting rid of plastic. <laughs> Adrian, I'm not sure if you want to add to that. Yeah, maybe just adding, um, connecting it with the question about global impact and global solution. Um, I mean, we burn it here in Switzerland, but it, it requires quite some uh, modern facilities and the process is really um, complex. And, and also, if you, if you don't do it right, you still pollute the air, the ground, and burning is, is, is not really, burning plastics is not really a good thing in, in general. It's, it's absolutely not, not effective to bring back, you are not able to bring back the, the, the value of the material into the circulation. You just, it's just gone and you have to source new ones. Thank you very much, Adrian. And I also, um, I think um, it would make sense to also add some information about why not use biodegradable plastics. Can you just uh, add uh, short information about that? Yes, um, there, there is a, a lot of initiatives going on to find replacement materials. And uh, we believe that there is quite some potential and that's the future where we want to 
uh, as, as a society have to go to, to have better materials. Uh, but, but we are definitely not there yet. Uh, we cannot replace all the, the packaging materials in, in, in short term with, uh, with alternative materials. And also uh, in our research, uh, we found out that biodegradable, biodegradable plastics um, sounds better than it is at the moment. So um, you would imagine that this means you can just throw it into the forest and uh, uh, after a year it's gone. But in reality, it's, it's a bit more complicated than that. It also needs facilities to process and, and, uh, and degrade the materials. Uh, and it's, it's really interesting that definitely uh, it needs more innovation, um, but we are not at the place where, where it's really solving the problem on, on big, big scale. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian and Charlotte. I'm handing back over to Jörn for, yeah, to wrap up the session. We have five minutes to go and we also have some information for you about upcoming events where Eckert, our president of the Geneva Marco Labs, will also add some information. So Jörn, over to you. Thank you, Renate. Um, the focus groups have worked really hard during the last months. They have been supported by a group of six mediators. And I can say I'm really proud about this, uh, re uh, these results. They have submitted detailed project proposals of up to 26 pages, covering every possible aspect from business model, market analysis to, of course, impact measurement. So how to choose the best project proposal? As we are relying on collective intelligence, it's not us but it's a jury of 15 experts that will read the re reports or already reading them, ask questions and vote for the best project proposal. This will be done next week on May 17th. So thank you for attending this impact talk, but we, of course, we are not stopping with this impact talk, but we have a very exciting announcement for the next events ready. Please Eckert, tell us what's next. Yeah, th thank you very much, Jan, and uh, uh, thank you very much also from my side for all this excellent work that these three focus groups have done. I mean, this was really impressive work that uh, that I actually just learned uh, the details about now in this in this webinar. So thanks a lot for all your excellent work. I'm really looking forward also to the to the jury event. Uh, just very quickly from my side, we have two uh, events coming up uh, that might also be of interest for you. One is in uh, two weeks' time on the 26th. Uh, we have. Um, uh, webinar on macroeconomic policies in fragile states. So we are way, way far away from impact. We are very much focused on what are what are the particular challenges that uh, especially fragile states like Libya or Somalia or some other countries of this type are facing right now and what kind of policy approaches can be handled to actually really kind of promote a little bit of, of uh, safety and stability in these countries. So, so we have two great speakers, uh, Ralf Shami from the International Monetary Fund, who actually has released a book exactly on that topic. Uh, with some co-authors uh, and Rima Yadi, who is professor uh, for economics professor at the uh, uh, City University of London and uh, president of the um, Euro Mediterranean uh, Economic Association. So, I mean, that would be a really exciting discussion going on uh, between these two. And then on the 3rd of June, uh, you're all very much invited to a longer, longer conference virtual event that uh, focuses on artificial intelligence and talent management, where we will have a three hour event focused on that specific topic and the challenges that uh, modern technologies bring to human resource management, to talent management, to finding the right jobs, finding the right people for the jobs, uh, developing new competence profiles, etc. A really exciting topic. We have uh, great speakers. We have Peter Capelli, professor at Wharton School. Uh, we have uh, um, Ashutosh Gorg from uh, CEO of Eightfold AI, which is a startup, Californian startup on talent management tools. And we have my colleague from the International Labour Organization, Janine Burke, joining us for the keynote speech. And then we have four expert sessions on different topics related to AI and talent management. And I hope very much to see all of you or most of you in this event because it's extremely exciting. We have speakers from basically the entire globe. We, start, As I said, we have people from California, obviously a lot of experts from Europe, and we have uh, Michael Fung from Skills Singapore, who will also handling a, a session there. So I hope that we, you can all join us on the 3rd of June uh, at 4 p.m. Uh, Central European time. So that's all for me. Thanks. And back to you, Jan. 
Uh, thank you, Eckhart, uh, the president of uh, Geneva Macrolabs. Um, please feel free to follow us on social media and please join us uh, uh, at the events that Eckhart just mentioned. Um, and happy to see you again. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Bye. Thank you, everybody. And please find the recorded video on our YouTube channel and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Bye, everyone. Thanks very much. Okay, goodbye. <laughs> the next Thank design you. thinking Thank workshop you. will be announced um, on Thank social media. You. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.